I want to thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Victory. We believe that the starting point for real life change is centered around God's word lived out with God's people. So no matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to inspire and equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, you will truly experience something more, something better. And if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us. No matter where you are in the world, you can tune in with us through Victory Everywhere. That's what we're calling our online campus, Victory Everywhere. Or if you're local, we'd love to have you join us here in person. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work that God does with our sacrificial giving and in our community and around the world. Now, if the message that you are about to hear helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God. Join us by going to victorycc.life slash give. Thank you again for watching. We hope you enjoy this message. about you, but I just love that video. It shows the life of the church and the impact of the church locally and globally, and it's just really amazing what God is doing through our church. If this is your first Sunday, you came on the perfect Sunday, because uh, we're kicking off this uh, new series called Revolution, and at Victory, our team has used this term, Revolution, to talk about local and global missions, because as Jesus followers, we, we get all of this from the teachings of Jesus when he calls his disciples together the night before he goes to the cross, and he tells his followers, he says, by this, so by this one thing, by this one dynamic, this is what I want to represent me, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So Jesus says to his followers, it's not enough just to believe in me. It's not enough just to study my word. It's not enough to memorize my teachings. It's not enough to worship the Bible. You have to apply what my word says. In fact, James, the half-brother of Jesus, says it this way. He says, faith by itself is not accompanied, if it's not accompanied by action is, what's that word? <laughs> Dead. And he goes on to say, you believe that there's one God? Belief, that's good. But even the demons believe that and shudder. So as Jesus followers, we want to move from believing in to actually following. Move from believing in to following. Why? Because that's what our Savior commanded us to do. By this, everyone, everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you represent me if you love one another. And this is the movement of Jesus. This was the revolution that started the first hospitals. This was the revolution that funded education for anyone and everyone. This was the, the, the revolution that ended slavery in the America. This was the revolution that stood up and for the unborn. And it was that kind of care and that kind of compassion and that kind of integrity and that kind of sacrifice that changed the world. In fact, even if you don't believe in the Bible, even if you look at it and think, hey, that's once upon a time, uh, even if you, know, if you think it's all made up, there is no other way to explain the church that you are sitting in today or watching online today than this revolution. The revolution of Jesus was founded on sacrifice and res the resurrection found on the love of Jesus. And so back in 
2019, we define the revolution, our church's approach this way. It's a revolution, it's a movement designed to affect fundamental changes in the world. And we got that from the movement of, of Jesus. Uh, so uh, from the very beginning, the movement of Jesus was, was meeting people's needs and valuing every kind of person. A movement where, where we were listening to Jesus and learning from Jesus and actually following Jesus. So for Jesus followers, this is so much more than just taking suggestions from Jesus. You know, like, what do you think Jesus wants me to wear? Like, like there's, it's more than suggestion. No, we believe that Jesus is the once and for all king of my life. So from the beginning, this movement, it started local and went global. It came local and it went global. So the next two weeks, they're going to be super special. In fact, July 3rd, Danny is going to come back and he's going to be preaching to all of us. He's going to be talking about the local work of victory in the city. You will not want to miss next week. And then on July 10th, we'll be sending out our own missions team to Dominican Republic. So we're going to pray for them in the service. It's going to be amazing. And they're going to be serving and leading and teaching there. Not only that. But Richard Natim is coming from Ghana, Africa to share with us. And he's the missionary at Camp, Camp Allendale this summer. So as we drop off our kids that very day, July 10th, Richard will be leading and teaching them all week. And so we have a special lineup for you to hear more about this revolution. How uh, locally and globally what God is doing through the world and, and through the church. But today is important. Because today I want to make it personal. I want you to take it personal. So if you're a Jesus, not a Jesus follower, you don't have to do any of this. But if you're a Jesus follower, you need to take it personally because it's not enough to just listen to what God is doing in other people's lives. Now you and I have to have a faith of our own. And so just so you know, you can belong here before you believe anything. It's not about belonging. But at some point, at some point, you have to develop a faith that is your own. We have to come to a point where we find and follow Jesus for ourselves. And so during this series, it's, it's my prayer that you would be inspired to move from believing to following. Because you know this. Even if you don't follow Jesus, just having beliefs doesn't make your life better. Do you know that? Just, I, can, I can believe that certain foods aren't good for me and eat them anyway. Just having beliefs doesn't change the world. To believe all the right things, it's just not enough. It takes action. And so we're going to look at the life of an Old Testament person that radically changed his culture. I'm going to tell you more about this guy than you probably wanted to know. And then I'm going to show you how God used them to affect like this revolutionary change in the world. We're going to, and then I'm going to ask you a question. So that's what, how this whole thing is going to go. Get ready for a history lesson. But if you have your Bible or mobile device, please turn to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, it's in the middle of the Old Testament, uh, before Psalms, Nehemiah. And as you're turning there, I'll just give you a little bit of a setup. So this account takes place during the Jewish exile. Uh, and just so you know, exile is being forced to live where you don't belong. So God's chosen people, the Israelites, were set apart. Uh, this people, they, they were called to affect change in the world, but, God, but God's people rejected God. By their actions, they said to God, God, I know what you want me to do. I don't want to do it. I know how you want me to follow you. I don't want to follow you. So God gave them exactly what they asked for, life without him. And that led the Israelites into the exile. So history records around 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar was the Babylonian king. Uh, and in 605 BC, the Babylonians invaded Judah. Uh, Judah is the southern king, uh, part of the southern kingdom of Israel. If you grew up in church, you remember this really famous account uh, in the, recorded for us in the book of Daniel. And this is where King Nebuchadnezzar carted off the famous Bible people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or if you grew up in church in the 90s, Rack, Shack, and Benny? No? Okay. So this is the beginning of the exile. So about 70 years go by, around 535 BC, and there is no temple. There's no sacrifices. There's no way for God's people to be made right with God for 70 years. And the Persians come in and knock off the Babylonians. They conquer the Babylonians, and they become, the Persians become, the most dominant a nation on the face of planet earth. And about three years later, so this isn't just in scripture, this is history. About three years later, around 538 BC, Cyrus the Great, Cyrus the Great is the Persian king and he learns from the Jewish people that his conquest and his reign was actually predicted by God through the prophet Isaiah 150 years before he was even born. 
I mean, so God used the prophet Isaiah and he gives this, some, this detailed prediction or a prophecy that Cyrus, King Cyrus, was, when, he, when he heard it, he's like, that's me. Can you imagine God predicting you? And you're like, oh my gosh, that's me. So he was so moved by, by the power of the insight of the God of the Israelites that he made a proclamation that the Jewish people could go home from exile. Uh, to rebuild the temple. So about 50,000 Jews leave and go home. And this is amazing timing because that timing was even predicted by the prophet Jeremiah. So, so uh, they, they go back home. They begin to establish the temple and they start off strong. But like many things, they just kind of got off track. Uh, and this is all set up, but there's a little bit more. About 43 years and three Persian kings later, the Persian king Xerxes comes to power. Now, if you grew up in church, you'll remember King Xerxes was important because he was married to Queen Esther. And Queen Esther was the Jewish queen to the Persians around 478 BC. She delivered the Jews in Persia because they were in trouble. So she was instrumental in the deliverance of Jews in Persia. And now her husband, King Xerxes, has a son. I'm almost done. He has a son. Uh, it could have been Esther's son. Probably wasn't. But his name was King Artaxerxes. And that's where King Artaxerxes' story meets the book of Nehemiah. So this is his history. Around 445 AD, uh, BC, Nehemiah, this trusted Jewish man, is cupbearer to the King Artaxerxes. And they have all of this history. Now, to be a cupbearer in that day was actually pretty fun most of the time. Because we would consider his job to be like a food and wine taster, which sounds like fun unless someone's trying to murder the king, right? And not so fun. Many, many times in those days, they would attempt to kill the king through like poisoning the king's food. Can you imagine that job? Most of the time, you get to eat the best food on the face of the planet. But if the king ever saw you get sick, you know, throwing up in the corner, suddenly the king's like, I'm not hungry tonight. Like it's just, it, it could be rough. So Nehemiah was a trusted Jewish man. And, and this is important. We don't know up to this point in his life if he'd ever been to Israel. So this takes place 90 years after the Jews are allowed to go back to Jerusalem. And Nehemiah is in Persia working for this king. And he begins to journal. So we have that journal recorded for us in a, the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is an extraordinary leader. In fact, if you're a leader, you want to learn leadership principles, you should read the book of Nehemiah. And it's a fascinating account to, to read, even if you're not a Bible person. If you wrestle, can this whole thing be true? This is a historical account. Because it's proven outside of the Bible. And what's interesting in this account is there's no miracles. This account of Nehemiah is really about his own response to a burden that God had laid on his life. So as you read the book of Nehemiah, you'll find that it's about wisdom and hard work and vision and discipline and heart and grit and leadership and you, know, you, you could read the whole book of Nehemiah pretty quickly. It's only 13 chapters. You should do that this week. But this morning, turn to chapter 1. It says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hilakalia, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year. So this is like not once upon a time. This is real history in the city of Susa. So this is a place that you could go and visit today. Susa was a primary city. that They didn't really have a capital city at that time, but it was like the capital he says, while I was in the citadel of Susa, uh, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah. So uh, Hananiah travels from Judah, the southern part of Israel, all the way back to Susa. And it, it says, w with some other men, and I questioned him about the Jewish remnant. So, so he's like, remember all those people who migrated back to their homeland? So Nehemiah's like, I wonder how it's going. So he goes, I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. So Nehemiah's brother is reporting back to Nehemiah, hey, what's it like back home? I wonder what God is doing back home. I, I heard that the, we got the temple thing going. Are we a nation yet? Are we the proud people of God yet? I'm excited to hear, how is God moving back home? Tell me about that. And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. It's like, oh, Nehemiah, you haven't heard? It's not going well. Our people back home, your relatives, they're in deep trouble. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have even been burned with fire. 
And at that time, the walls meant protection. The gates were so that they could secure the nation. And after all of that time, 90 years had been gone by where they were allowed to be a nation again, and they are far from being a nation. They are far from being the people of God, the proud people of God. They are left without protection. They keep on getting attacked by bands of raiders. They are pillaged. Every day, our relatives, they're in great trouble. Our people, our relatives are a laughing stock. We are a disgrace. Nehemiah, you just won't believe how bad it is back home. And what happens next is so powerful. Nehemiah writes it down, his response. He says, when I heard of these things, I sat down and I what? What's that word? I wept. In other words, for Nehemiah, it wasn't just news. He didn't turn on the news and hear about the war in Ukraine or rising gas prices or inflation or division across America. This wasn't just news. This wasn't just interesting. He didn't say, well, I live in Susa. I work for the king. Yeah, my life is pretty good. I, I'm, I'm with the most powerful, most wealthy country in the whole world. See ya, wouldn't want to be ya. That, that was not his response. When he found out what was going on, his heart just it broke. And he began to, to weep. And it messed with him for days. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever heard something on TV or bumped into someone who's been wrong? Or you hear about a need and it just, it just messes with you for days? It breaks your heart? If you have, Nehemiah could say, me too. You're not alone. In fact, he writes it in his journal. He says, for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So when Nehemiah hears what's going on, he begins to center his heart and his life on God. He begins to fast and to bring clarity and dependence on God. He prays, God, would you just get involved in this? He knows this is too big for just him. So he mourns, he fasts, he prays. Get this, and this is huge. He prays for a place. He prays for a people he's probably never met yet. Then he said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great awesome God who keeps his covenant. So Nehemiah is now reminding God, okay, God, I know you keep your covenant. I know you keep your promises because we return to Jerusalem after 70 years just like you promised to the prophet Isaiah. So God, I want to remind you that there was more to your promise. And he uses that word covenant uh, because God had established a covenant with Israel. Another word for covenant, again, is promise. So God had established this promise with the people of Israel. So Nehemiah is like, God, remember your promise? And he begins to quote the promise of God back to God. He says, Lord, the God of heaven and earth, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commands. Now, because this is interesting, in the Old Testament... God has set up this semi-conditional relationship with the people of Israel. So this is not our promise. This is their promise. This is not our covenant. This is their covenant. But this promise goes uh, uh, that God made them went a little bit like this. Here are my laws. Here are my decrees. Here are my commands. You keep them. You can live in my land. And you can be my people. But if you break my laws, if you abandon me, if you turn your back on me and my blessing, I, I will remove my blessing from your life and you will be sent to all of the nations around the earth just like everybody else. And that is exactly what happened. Nehemiah goes on, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer. Your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants. He's praying day and night for other people, the people of Israel. And then Nehemiah does something interesting. He does something that Jesus' followers are called to do. He, he says it this way. He says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. So here's the translation. God, I look back at everything that's happened. We deserved it. We deserved what happened to us. We, we broke the agreement. So just so you know, whenever you confess to God, it's not just like, sorry, and shrug it off. Like, sorry, you know. It's not preference. No, you confess. It goes, God, you were right. I was wrong. Please forgive me. God, you were right. You were more right than I wanted to. I was wrong. <laughs> wrong. Please forgive me. So when Nehemiah says, it's, it's our fault. We were wrong. God, forgive us. We broke the agreement. We broke the covenant. And he goes on, to, he says it this way. We've not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave your servant Moses. And so Nehemiah is so serious about this that he reaches back over 800 years and asks for forgiveness for stuff that happened 800 years ago. Could you imagine being so moved? 
that you prayed for forgiveness of things that happened in 1222 AD? <laughs> God, would you just forgive things that happened 800 years ago? And then Nehemiah says, God, you made us a promise. I, I want to go back to your promise. Way back when you, Moses gave us those commands, he says, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying. So he's quoting God again back to God. He says, God, you said, remember you said, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations, which is what happened. That's why he's writing this from Susa, not Jerusalem. If you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations, but... But if you return to me and obey my commands, and that's a pretty big promise, right? If we turn to God, God, this is so interesting. I love this about you because you knew, you knew we were going to stray. But you even back then, you had a plan to connect us back to you, even when we messed up. But but if you return to me and obey my commands, then, then even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, they're scattered to the furthest horizon. I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. And so what Nehemiah did when his people were far from God is what we should actually do. Too many times we try to run away or we get embarrassed or we get bitter or we get angry. He goes to God and says, God, I know you're loving. I know I messed up. I know you're forgiving, but I trust your promise. I'm going to turn back to you. And I want you to do what only you can do. And he continues. He says, they, talking about the people of Israel, they are your servants and your people whom you redeemed. And I love this because it mirrors our story. Do you remember the life of Moses, this whole thing with the plagues and Egypt and let my people go? You remember all of that? All right. God, you've already gone to trouble of redeeming us once. You've already bought us one time, right? You've already purchased us from Egypt, Egypt once. You, we were scattered. Now we're scattered all over the place. So God, I'm just asking, would you forgive me again? Would you redeem me again? Would you save us again? They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand, Lord. Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. And he asks for something very specific. He says, Father, give your servant success today by, by granting him favor in the presence of he says, this man. Now, what Nehemiah is going to do is what some, no one in their culture did. He's about to go to King Artaxerxes of Persia, the most powerful man on the planet, his boss. And, and everyone in his culture thinks this guy is like a god. He's about to go to him and do something no one did. He's going to go ask this king for a favor. And he goes, I, King, I need an indefinite leave of absence. I, I want to leave my cush job. I want to leave this incredible environment that you provided here in Susa. And I want to travel all the way back to my hometown in Jerusalem. I want to help my people rebuild their city and reestablish their presence in the land. So he says to God, first, hey, you're big, you're able, you're loving, you're willing. But this, uh, this king, who everyone on earth thinks is a God, but God, I know he's just a man like everybody else. I, God, would you give me favor in the presence of this human? Now, what Nehemiah is about to do, again, is risky because who knows how the king will respond? You just didn't do this. He could just off with his head, right? Not only that, but if the king says yes, it's actually more difficult because he's going to leave the comfort of this kingdom. But Nehemiah's heart was broken. He felt compassion. He had to act. And so in chapter 2, we read about how God opened the heart of the king. And when the king uh, asked Nehemiah what he could do for Nehemiah, he does what leaders do. He was ready. He was prepared. He knew what he needed and he asked for a ton. He asked for time off. He asked for expensive building materials, like really expensive things. He asked for paper to show that he had the king's authority. He was even given a personal escort to Jerusalem back when camels were expensive, just like gas, right? So, so when a time wing was right, Nehemiah knew what to ask for. And he records the moment this way. Because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. To which you're like, okay, so that's good. That's like happily ever after, right? Confess you're wrong. Pray to God for something that breaks your heart and then God will fix it. Done. And hear me, I, I don't think enough Jesus followers understand this, but if you're gonna join the revolution, if you're gonna do work, God's work in this world, it will be difficult. You will have enemies, especially if you do the right thing. 
I mean, too many Jesus followers actually give up, and we give up too soon because we don't realize that this is true. What's true for Nehemiah is true for us as well. And while I don't know your, the name of your arch nemesis, I do know the name of his. And he had a really cool bad guy name. His name was Sanballat. Right? Isn't that cool? <laughs> Sanballat, the, the Amorite official, heard about this, and, and they were very much disturbed. So even before Nehemiah gets there, Sanballat, his arch nemesis, is upset because this wall for him meant that he couldn't steal from the Israelites anymore. This was taking some of his money, some of his wealth. Not only that, if Jerusalem gets the walls rebuilt, if they build an army, they might be competition with us for this part of the world. So Sanballat gets very, very defensive, very, very threatened by this. And it sounds simple to say. Hey, I'm just going to go back and we're going to rebuild the walls. But Nehemiah, he realized he couldn't do this by himself. He had to inspire the people. He had to convince the people. He had to do something that maybe you will have to do if you're going to join the revolution. He he goes up to people and says, hey, you, you know there's a better way. God's got more for you. Now, I know you've been living this way your whole life. And I know you don't even know where to start. And I know you feel really defeated. But God's got something better for you. And so Nehemiah tells them how God worked on the heart of the king. And Nehemiah reveals his plan. He casts vision. He inspires the people. And they start building. And again, it's like, is this happily ever after now? No. Because old Sam Ballad begins to send spies throughout the city to start rumors about who? Nehemiah. They begin to discourage the people. And they begin to try to make the people think it will never happen for you. That we haven't rebuilt the wall in 90 years. Your dad couldn't do it. Your grandpa couldn't do it. What makes you think you can escape this? What makes you think you could do it? And old Sam Ballot tried to discourage the people. And when that didn't work, he actually sent armed forces to attack the workers at the wall. And so much so that, that Nehemiah had to pull people off the wall and, and, and arm them. Nehemiah records it this way. He says, even those who, who carried building materials worked with one hand and, and kept a weapon in the other. Could you just imagine going to work with a sword? You're type, typing. With a, like, I don't know, right? So, so they took shifts and they, they were on guard. And, and no matter what Sam Ballot tried, the wall all got higher and higher and higher. So they finally got to the place where it was almost complete. They were ready to rebuild the gates. And Sam Ballot, he tries a different strategy. And this is what your enemy will try to do to you. Sam Ballot tried to distract Nehemiah. Nehemiah records it this way. A word came to Sam Ballot, Tobiah Geshem, at the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it. Though up to that time, I had not set the doors in the gates. Sam Ballot and Geshem sent me this message. So guy, the guy, these guys write Nehemiah a letter and they give it to a messenger. And the messenger shows up and rattles Nehemiah's ladder. Say, hey, come on down here. I've got a, a letter Can you imagine getting a letter from your arch nemesis? I got a letter from the enemy. He says, come, let us meet together. Hey, we need to go have lunch. Let's go get some breakfast. Let's go go do a coffee. Maybe we can have dinner. And in one of the villages on the plain of, (laughs) oh no. (laughs) If you ever get invited to the plain of, oh no, don't go. (laughs) Don't, just don't go. I mean, come and let us meet together. But Nehemiah knows that they don't want to have brunch. He says, but they... But they were plotting to harm me. So I send a messenger to them saying, and what comes next is the verse that just jumps off the pages of Scripture. I think it might become some people's life verse, right? When you think about raising your kids or your finances or building your relationship with your spouse or when you grow old, maybe you're older and you're single and you feel lonely, but you know that if you're still here, God still has something for you. Like you're still, you're still, God's still got something for you to do. I think we need this verse at every age and every stage of our life. And the, here's the message that Nehemiah sent all the way back to Sam Ballot. He says, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. You go tell Sam Ballot, I'm doing a great work right here and I cannot come down. Would you just say this word, these words with me? Ready? One, two, three. I, I, do, Great job. One more time. One, two, three. 
And there's something in your life, there's a wall in your life that you need to complete. Whatever the task is, whatever the thing that God has called you to do, I'm telling you, as you join the revolution of bringing heaven to earth, it could be where you serve. It could be who you raise. It could be where you work. It could be who the difficult person you're called to love. Life is trying to distract you. Schedules are trying to distract you, but God wants you to know that you're doing a good work. God's calling you to raise godly kids. I mean, parents, the next time, I don't know if you ever do this, but sometimes our house gets crazy and I just look at my wife and be like, what's going on? What is this? The kids blow up. It's a meltdown. You have to pick up the pieces. It's like we're tempted to be upset or distracted. I want you to whisper to yourself, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. In the middle of all of that, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Like you know that God is calling you to serve when it's difficult. You, you know that God's calling you to, to live uh, even though you're discouraged. You're called to, to do good things and big things for him. And in that moment, you want to give up. Remind yourself, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Maybe you're a college student or a single adult. And, and you know what you choose to do now. The sacrifices you choose right now set you up for future success. But in your life, you have your friends and they're a little bit distracting. And you can say, I, I know you're cute. But I'm not coming down. I know that sounds like a great opportunity, but I cannot come down. I'd love to hang out with you. The party sounds great, but I am not coming down. I, got, I know God is guiding me. I know God has a plan for me. I know God is in this. I feel moved by God. I'm not coming down. Now, just because you decide to stay focused doesn't mean the distractions stop. In fact, Sam Ballot didn't give up because they sent messengers to me four times in this manner. So they sent another message and another message. Hey, your, you have your people call my people. Let's check our schedule. You can't work 24-7. Come on, Nehemiah. And here's what's so significant for us. If Nehemiah had come off that wall, if Nehemiah had actually met with Sam Ballot, they would have taken his life. Do you know that there are things in your life, there are things in my life, if we do not complete them, if we do not focus on them, if we don't deal with them, they have the potential to ruin our lives as well. There are things that if you just kind of ignore it, it'll use Nehemiah's term, it will kill your family. It'll kill your marriage. It will kill your relationship with your kids or maybe even your grandkids. There are things that if you don't give attention to this, if you don't focus on this, if you don't have grit, if you don't say, I'm staying on the ladder till I finish this wall, it will kill what you love the most. I want you to look at Nehemiah's example. They sent the messengers four times, and he says this, I answered them in the very same way. I'm doing a great work. I don't always get it right all the time, but I'm doing a great work, and I will not come down. Now, the fact that Nehemiah wouldn't come off the wall did not discourage his enemies. In fact, they came up with all kinds of things. One, uh, they started this rumor that they actually hoped would get him in trouble with the king of Persia. Uh, he says, hey, Nehemiah is building this kingdom to make a kingdom of Judah for himself, to rebuild those walls so he can train an army and go back and rebel against you, O oh great king Artaxerxes. And they, they thought that this rumor would make Nehemiah go like, uh-oh, because this was like a death penalty, you know, for, for him to attack the Persian king and, and, and go back and say, king, these rumors aren't true. But Nehemiah just shook his head and said, I'm not leaving the wall. I'm not leaving what God called me to do until it's finished. And when that didn't work, they tried something else. They sent a friend. This friend's name was Shemaiah. They called him over to his house and, said, and says, hey, listen, Nehemiah. We need you to know that you have enemies, not just outside the city, but in the city. There are Jews in the city whose livelihoods are being threatened by this wall. So there's a group of people who plan to murder you in your life or in, while, while you sleep. So now, Nehemiah, because I'm your friend, I, I probably wouldn't do this, but I'm telling you, there's people out there who want to kill you. So we need to go right now and leave this place and go to the temple and we need to cling to the altar. Now, because in that day, if a man or woman fled to the temple and clung to the altar, the law said that they couldn't be put to death until they had a fair trial. So Nehemiah, we need to go cling to the altar. And he looked at him and said, I don't believe you. And even if it's true, I'm not coming down. I'm not going to stop until this wall is complete. I, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. I'm not letting go. I'm not letting the rumors pull me off. I'm not letting the threats pull me off. I'm not letting my fears pull me off. I'm not letting my distractions pull me off. I'm not letting missed opportunities throw me off. I'm not letting anything pull me off. I'm doing a great work right here, right now. I cannot 
come down. I will not come down. Amen. And so the book of Nehemiah tells us eventually that they finished this wall. And here's how the author uh, writes it. He says this way. So the wall was completed on the 25th of the month of Elu in how many days? 52 days. Isn't that amazing? You see, this wall that remained a pile of rubble for a hundred years, even though people had worked on it for a long time, but with vision and inspiration and focus and grit and determination, they rebuilt the wall in 52 days. And I want you to check out what happens next. It says, when all of our enemies heard of it and all of the surrounding nations uh, 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 saw it, they lost their confidence for they recognized that this was the work, this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Now that statement is interesting because this whole account, there, there are no miracles. They didn't wake up one morning and another layer was added to the wall. That didn't happen. The lightning bolts did not strike their enemies as they prayed. God, you know, they, that, that didn't happen. There's no earthquake. There's nothing supernatural in this whole account. This should encourage you because they're just men and women that knew in their hearts that, there's, that God had something that needed to be done. There was a leader that said, I can't come down from this wall. And God honored their hard work and God honored their discipline and God honored their faithfulness. And at the end of the day, everybody stepped back and was amazed. God must be doing something with this group of people. It bears the thumbprint of God. So as we take God's word and we apply it to our life, as we make this revolution personal, I want you to look around the world. There's so many areas that need love and the grace and the truth and the hope that God offers. It's easy to get overwhelmed. All right, but it's so easy to think God use somebody else. But as Jesus follows, we don't have that choice. You and I, we've been commanded to embrace our role of bringing heaven to earth. So as we make this personal, let me ask a clarifying question. And just so you know, I don't expect you to have the answer with today. In fact, I want this question to mess with you this week. But if I, if I could really get my promise or my hope, I want to mess with you the rest of your life. That's, I want my, these words to mess with you. You ready? Here's the question. What breaks your heart? What breaks your heart? When you look around the community, when you look around your family, when you look around your neighborhood, when you look around at all that's wrong in our world, what captures your emotions? What disturbs you so much as you just try not to think about it? What comes to mind that's so bad and so broken you tell yourself, well, I, God, I'm just too young or I'm too old or I'm too middle class or I'm too busy or I'm too disconnected. What would I even do? What breaks your heart? Because for Nehemiah, this whole account, it started. Remember how it all started when he looked back and the people were in great distress the walls have been burned. Remember all of that? And remember, he's thinking about his people being attacked and, and they were a disgrace. And he says, when I heard these things, when I heard these things, I sat down and he says, it broke my heart because I, I wept. And it became personal to me. He knew God was calling him and it just, just messed with him and broke his heart. And so when it comes to this revolution that God calls every Jesus follower to embrace. As we embrace our role of bringing heaven to earth, when you look around the community, when you look around our world, what breaks your heart? What is God moving you to do? Do you know what will happen if you don't do it? If we don't do it, you know what we'll choose to do instead? Blame. It's the president's fault. It's Congress's fault. It's school system's fault. It's somebody else's fault. It's not my fault. See, if we don't engage with what God has laid on our heart, we will just look for somebody to blame. But you already know this. Just look at Congress. <laughs> People who blame things never change things. People who blame things never change things. And you, you could do that if you want, but if you're a Jesus follower, because of what Jesus taught, and because of what Jesus commanded, and because of how Jesus lived, it is impossible to follow Jesus and do nothing. In fact, everywhere Jesus went in the New Testament, people around him were better off. He didn't just feel compassion, he acted compassionately. Jesus served men and women and children. He cared for tax collectors and prostitutes. He, he cared for people caught in the act of adultery. And Jesus interacted with them. He wasn't judging them. Jesus made efforts to restore them back to their heavenly father because this isn't about good people and bad people. Jesus said this is about lost people and found people. And when we read the accounts in the New Testament, when we go back to how the revolution started, we see that, that the more messed up your life was, the bigger impact Jesus' love made on your life. 
In fact, when we read about our heritage, we go back to the book of Acts and we see the first Christians, they realize that believing the gospel is more than just accepting Jesus' death for you. There's more to it than that. It's about accepting Jesus' life in you. That God wants to use you not to judge this broken world and not to find fault with this broken world, not to, un- to p- place blame in this broken world, but to show this broken world the life-changing love of Jesus. And Nehemiah's heart broke in preparation for what God would do 440 years later. The final, when the final Jewish prophet, priest, and king, who is known as Jesus, walked those same very, same, very same streets, surrounded by that very same wall, where God sent his son to do for us what we could never do on our own. Because, because our sin broke the heart of our heavenly father. Because God, we broke God's heart, he made the first move towards us. And that means just like that, you have no idea what hangs in the balance of your decision to embrace the burden that God has placed on your heart. You have no idea what. You have no idea who. You have no idea who in your neighborhood or your family or at work. You have no idea what hangs in the balance of your decision to embrace the burden that God has placed on your heart. So let me just ask you, would you join the revolution? Would you join the revolution? Would you help bring heaven to earth? Would you answer the question this week, what breaks your heart? Would you pray with me? Father, it is so easy for me to get up here and preach these things, but it's very difficult for us to actually try to live that out. So Father, as we wrestle with what breaks our heart this week, I pray that you'd give us clarity and insight and wisdom to know what to do with what we're feeling, that you'd allow us to feel hurt or broken or even cry. Father, then I pray that you give us the, the clarity to know what steps to take next and the courage to actually do it. To Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, we have next steps for everybody uh, here in person. It's out the door and to the left and online. Matt, will you come on up? Uh, online, uh, text next to 317-576-2288. And I, we have, I want to just close something special. Uh, we don't do this very often, but uh, Matt is a special guy. If you don't, you probably, if you've been to Victory very long, come on over here, Matt. I like you. Uh, <laughs> if you've been to Victory very long, you've seen this guy serve in some place. Uh, he, you've served in soccer, the kids ministry, cafe. I've seen you take food to seniors. I've I've, I've seen you clean the parking lot. I've seen you help Allie, who works here. I, I, don't, I don't, I've seen you, we saw you get baptized. I've, I've seen a lot of Matt do a lot. And, uh, but Matt is getting ready to leave for a year. He's got uh, orders and he's on assignment. And he's leaving his family here uh, for a year. And Matt is going to leave a huge hole here. And so I just want to pray for him. I'm thankful for him. <clears throat> I can't look at you. And uh, all of our service people. And I'm just thankful for him. So would you just pray if I can get through this? If not, let the Holy Spirit translate that. But uh, pray for Matt. Father, just thank you for Matt. I thank you for his heart for you. His heart to protect and lead and care for the people of our country by serving. I pray that you just put a hedge of protection around him. And uh, that you put a hedge around his family. And that uh, they would all sense whether here in the States with Allie and the kids or where he's far off, where he feels like far from home, that he would sense your presence and your nearness and your care. So Father, I thank you for him. I thank you for his life. And I just pray that you would uh, use him, continue to use him as an influence and a light. And Father, may his absence challenge our people to step up and step out. So Jesus, in my prayer, amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, here at Victory, we don't just go to church. We go are the church everywhere we go, even if it's a different country. You're still a part. So uh, help us go be a part of the revolution this week. Have a great week.